Thank you for reminding us that we're not that strong and we're not that smart. But our strength is found in radical dependence upon you. Now, Lord, as we consider your word through the Apostle Paul about radical protection, I pray for protection even around this auditorium, for your holy angels to be here, your Holy Spirit to continue to work in our midst and in our hearts that we may hear a clear word from you. And we give thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. It was about 11 o'clock at night when our phone rang. I'm normally asleep at 11 o'clock at night because I get up early in the morning. But this night we had some friends at our home. We lived about six or seven kilometers from the campus of Southern Adventist University in Tennessee. And we were enjoying a nice evening, and the phone rang. It was my neighbor, Steve. Steve said, Derek, could you come down to our house and pray? We're having a problem here. Apparently, a group of young people from the university had spent the evening and they were closing off their time with a season of prayer. I'm getting a little ringing and I know it's not my hearing aid because I don't have one. (laughs) If we could just turn that down a little, that would be great. Thank you. And they were praying around the circle and came to a young lady. Now, they weren't requiring everybody to pray, but people were kind of saying a short prayer. You've maybe done that at Gateway or at a care group. They were just praying around the circle. Came to this one young lady, and she couldn't pray. I didn't say she didn't want to. She couldn't. And one of my students who was there carelessly got up unprotected, walked over to put his arm around this young lady, I suppose with the intention of either comforting her or praying for her, and as he came over, she shoved him across the room. And then there was this unsettled feeling as she was tossing and turning, laying on the floor, the wife of the household who was a nursing instructor taught there with my wife was nursing the head of this student. She was a a nursing major and she was there on the floor restless and Steve saying, can you come down and pray? I turned to my wife who was there and I asked if we could gather and pray in our home before I went to my neighbor's house. We prayed together, and I'll talk to you about the prayer that we prayed. But we prayed together, and and as I left the house, I did not know, but later I thanked God that my wife and those there continued to pray through the night until I returned. Thank God someone's praying, because the battle is real. Got in my little car, drove about a quarter of a mile to my neighbor's house. As soon as I walked in the house, uh, there's this unsettled feeling, a feeling of confusion in the house. And I walk into one room, and there the student is laying on the floor, people around her. And they're saying things like, say Jesus. She's like, I don't understand what you're saying. I remember walking into the room and the thought came that I would kneel down and place my hand on her foot and pray a blessing in the name of Jesus. And as I knelt down and reached out my hand, 
she rose up like she wanted to rip my head off of my shoulders. I don't have a lot of hair on my arms or the back of my neck, but it all stood up, every one that I had. I mean, it was scary. And then a voice spoke and said, She opened her life to me. And I'm looking and I'm going, I don't understand what's going on here. It would be like being at a care group last night and you go around and you name all the people and you're singing, you know, nice little songs. And, and then the next day there's this lady on the floor and a voice speaking out of her, she opened her life to me. And it wasn't her voice. I did not know what had happened. I found out later that two weeks earlier, this young lady became angry with God. Now, I want you to listen very carefully. I'm especially wanting the young people to listen very carefully. If you ever get angry with God, God is able to handle your anger. Somebody agree with me? Yeah, okay. You know, Father, you have a son who gets angry because he can't go out to play, and he may pound on your leg and even say a mean thing like, I hate you and you're so mean. Do you stop loving your son? <laughs> you say, what are you, why are you even asking me that? Do you stop loving your child when she's angry with you? Of course not. I want to tell you, if you ever have a time in your life when you feel angry with God, you can tell him that you're angry. He can handle your anger. But don't do what this young lady did. Because in her anger, and it wasn't really related to God, it was related to a failed relationship, but somehow, sometimes we take it out on God. And she got angry with God, and she said, God, get out of my life, and I'm not coming back. That is a dangerous thing to say. You see, if you read your Bible, and I know some of you are just starting to read the Holy Scriptures, but if you read your Bible, there is a great battle between good and evil. And while God loves us and wants to save us, the enemy is trying to destroy us. It's a real battle. And if you tell God to get out of your life, there is only one other kingdom. Oh, you say, no, I'm just going to be in charge of my own life. That is a foolish idea. We wrestle against principalities and powers. So if, if this young lady says, God, get out of my life and I'm not coming back, she has stepped onto very dangerous ground. Because God will honor your request. He will not abandon you. He will be right there when you call upon him. But she said, God, get out of my life. I'm not coming back, and I'm going to break all of your laws. Rebellion. This was actually a Sabbath day, and she went off to a shopping center, and she randomly bought things that she didn't need. What was she doing? In your face, God, I'm going to break all of your laws. Now, I realize there are people out at a shopping center this afternoon. They have no idea about the fact that God has a sacred day, and he says, remember it and keep it holy. They have no idea. And I don't think they're all being harassed by evil forces necessarily because they're shopping, right? But do you see the difference in this young lady's attitude? 
This is a willful and deliberate rebellion against God. Now, I have a question for you. How do you think she felt while she was deliberately transgressing a commandment of God? How do you think she felt? Anyone? Guilty? Wrong. Terrible? Wrong. Happy? Wrong. Yes, who said that? She said, I felt very powerful for a sign of demonic activity. Deliberately transgressing a known commandment of God that she knew was the teaching of God's word and deliberately transgressing it and, and feeling not guilt or shame or sadness, but powerful. She kept going to the care groups She'd even be in a prayer circle, but she said, I was cold and hard on the inside. And then that night, as they're praying around the circle, and she's not able to pray, and someone carelessly comes over, unprotected, and now here she is laying on the floor, and I hear a voice. She opened her life to me. I've got a choice to make at that moment. I have to choose whether I'm going to allow that fear to immobilize me. And that's the devil's weapon, isn't it? Fear and death. Or am I going to keep my eyes focused on Jesus, yes, looking to Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith, the one who began a work will be faithful to complete it. So I have to choose where I'm going to look. My human nature wants to shrink back. I'm afraid. But I can make a choice. I'm going to focus on God. So I, I, I cry out to God right there. There's everybody around. And, 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 and God flashes a scripture into my mind. Now, I am so thankful that this community of faith values memorizing the Word of God. Because I want to tell you from personal testimony that we're not that smart. And if you think you can learn something in a little manual that's going to help you when you're battling against principalities and powers, if you think you can take a little seminar that's going to make you really powerful in the battle against the evil one, you are fooling yourself. There is only one weapon that stands against the kingdom of darkness, and that is the Word of God. So that is why I'm so passionate about hiding God's Word in our hearts. And whether we use the fast with the scripture cards or scripture songs or saturation where we listen to the Bible over and over. Whatever you do, take time to fill your mind with the scriptures because the Bible says that that is a weapon against the evil one. So I'm there and this passage of scripture flashes into my mind. Do you have your Bible with you or your laptop or your iPhone? We're going to the book of Ephesians in the New Testament, chapter 6, this passage of Scripture flashed into my mind. And it says in Ephesians 6, verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong. What does it say? You see, you cannot fight with the weapons of this world. Be strong how? in the Lord. One of my students at Southern Adventist University talked about a time in his life. You can read about it in the book Radical Protection. But he talked about a time in his life. He drifted away from God. He came under satanic attack. He had a loaded gun on the table by his bedside. His first impression was to shoot at that evil presence. And then he realized you can't use the weapons of this world. Do you know what his second impression was? To shoot himself. The battle is real. And Scripture says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. 
And then the Apostle Paul says, you need to put on the whole armor of God. Now, that word in the Greek is, is one noun. It's the word whole armor, panoplia, from which we get the English word panoply. It means a covering, a covering, panoply, uh, pan all hoplia weapons, all of the weapons, but it's a covering. Paul says, I want you to cover yourself, to put on the whole armor, but it's not your armor, it's not something you make, it's the whole armor what? Of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. This text flashed into my mind as I'm kneeling there at the foot of this student, and, and, and this voice has just spoken, she opened her life to me. This text flashes into my mind. And so, in response to the word of God that the Spirit had brought to my remembrance. And by the way, I am so thankful for the word of Jesus in Matthew chapter 10. Maybe you've read this before, but in Matthew chapter 10, I'm impressed to just share this with you, in verse 8, 19. When they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. But listen to me carefully. That doesn't mean you've got a blank mind. The Holy Spirit will speak. How does the Holy Spirit speak? Answer, John 14, 26. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your what? See, you know the text, don't you? Then fill your mind with the Word. Because if you don't, the Holy Spirit can't bring it to your remembrance. Fill your mind with the Word of God. And so this text flashes into my mind, and I'm like, Lord, I will do it. And so I begin to pray the belt of truth to cover this young woman, the breastplate of righteousness, the gospel of peace on her feet, the shield of faith. You know the text. I'm quoting now from Ephesians 6. The shield of faith with which you can extinguish what? Not just the darts of the evil one, but what? The fiery darts, but not just the fiery darts, but what? All of the fiery darts of the evil one. Someone ought to say amen. Amen. I mean, that's really encouraging. That means there's no fiery dart, Joe, that the enemy can fire at you that can penetrate the shield of faith. All of them can be extinguished by the shield of faith. I'm praying that. Now, I don't know that anything's happening. And I know some of you here are like me. You're like, Derek, how do you know that's going to do any good? I mean, there's a battle going on. There's a evil spirit speaking out of this girl, and you think that by praying this little prayer that it's going to make any difference? Oh, you don't understand, because I'm going to pray this in Jesus' name. (laughs) I'm going to pray this in Jesus' name, and the demons will tremble. Because at the name of Jesus, every knee is going to bow. So I'm going to pray this. I'm not praying this in my name or in your name, I'm praying this in the name of Jesus. Now get this, I talked to this young lady, you remember I talked to a lady, she told me what she'd done, got angry with God, well I talked to her, and she said, you know when you are praying the armor piece by piece, listen to this, she said, every piece of the armor that you prayed, new strength came to me. (laughs) Is that awesome? Every piece of the armor that you prayed, new strength came to me. The helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. That's the weapon, the, 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 
sayings of God in his holy word, the sword of the spirit. As I prayed this armor over her, finally, she said, new strength came to me. And finally, she cried out, Jesus, save me. And Jesus set her free. Aren't you glad he doesn't say, well, a couple of weeks ago, you just told me to get out of your life. He loves us too much to leave us in a desperate situation. Praise him. <laughs> Jesus saved me. And Jesus set her free. She was so excited. I'm right there watching this. She gathered some of her friends. She said, we've got to pray for other people. There are other people that need to be covered with the armor. Listen to me this afternoon. There is someone who needs your prayers. She said, we've got to pray for other people. There's someone you know who's not praying for himself. That person needs your prayers. She said, we've got to pray for the armor of God over those people. Is she right? She's absolutely right. The battle's real. Some people that we know, some people we love, they're not praying for themselves. She said, we've got to pray. So she gathered a little circle of prayer. I didn't know what was about to happen. She told me later when we visited. She said, we're kneeling in a circle of prayer, and while we're praying that evil presence came right up to her again. She said, at first, I was tempted to be afraid. <laughs> but then she said, I just began to praise God because I realized that it could not enter me because I was covered with the armor of God. <laughs> Radical protection. But I want you to hear something very important. That protection is not automatically given. If it was, Paul wouldn't say, listen, put it on. And in case you didn't hear him in verse 11, look at verse 13. Still in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 13. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. And Jesus is wanting to protect us for us to be covered with the panoply of God, all of the weapons of God, all of the power of God. Now, we can't see that. And some of us who are a little skeptical, we go, I don't know, Derek, that's, that's a bit, you know, because you can't see it. But I want to tell you, the forces of darkness can see it. Do you know what it looks like to the forces of darkness? Do you know what the armor of God looks like to the forces of darkness? Romans chapter 13, you'll find the answer. Romans chapter 13, you may not be able to see it. There are people in this room who are covered with the armor of God. I'm praying before this meeting is over, every person here will choose to be covered with the armor of God. You'll be able to, you won't see it, but it will be apparent in the battle. Look at what it says. I'm in Romans 13, verse 12. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of what? The armor of God is the armor of what? Now, you say, well, Derek, uh, I can't see that some people here are like covered in a panoply of light. But it is there. And the kingdom of darkness is aware of those who are protected. You remember our first parents in the garden held open communion with God? And then they disobeyed God and they lost something. 
they were covered in a robe of light. And they lost that robe. And they realized that they were... So they tried to make clothes, right? Fig leaves. They tried to cover. They, they'd never felt that way before. As a result of sin, we lost that robe of light. But through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, he covers us again with the panoply of God. Amen? That's really good news. You may not be able to see it, but it's real. Verse 14 of the same Romans, chapter 13. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this armor of God is really, it all represents Christ. You're asking to be clothed with all of the glory of Christ and all of the purity of Christ and all of the holiness of Christ. You're asking that every part of you stand solidly under the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are recognizing that Jesus is not only your Redeemer, but He is also your Deliverer and Protector. And Paul is telling us in Ephesians chapter 6 that we must choose to accept the radical protection that God alone can provide. Now, you can choose how to do that. I don't think there's this... I'm just going to say, God, I want to pray today that you would cover me with the panoply of God. And then when you're done praying that sky, you pray for your wife. You pray for your family. You, you, you pray if you have children. You pray for your little one. And, and I'm going to share something with you that some of you can come up and discuss with me after, but I believe it with all my heart, so I'd love to hear your conversation on this. I believe with all my heart that if you pray for radical for protection for someone who's not praying for himself or herself, it will be given unless they willfully reject it. God loves all of his children. If you pray for someone, unless they willfully reject, God will hear your prayer in Jesus' name and will cover them. <laughs> so if God brings someone to your mind, don't wait until the end of the day. Pray now in the name of Jesus. Oh, they could willfully reject. They could say, I, I renounce that. That's a choice they could make. But if they don't, God will honor your prayer in Jesus' name. It was 2.15 in the morning. I, uh, I was asleep at 2.15. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but have you ever been woken up by a phone call and they say, did I wake you up? <laughs> Why do they say that? It's like 2.15 in the morning. Did I wake you up? And, and to make matters worse, Sometimes without, I don't know why I say this, but I go, no. <laughs> you, you know what? No, I'm awake. I'm, I'm awake. It's 2.15 in the morning. Did I wake you up? No. But then as soon as Robert started speaking, I was wide awake. My wife was awake. Robert said, uh, Dr. Morris, one of my students, he said, We've got a problem in the dormitory. Just down the road, around the corner on the campus of Southern Adventist University, a, a, a young man who was feeling very troubled had taken a box cutter, razor blade, and was cutting his arm from his wrist to his elbow. That's not normal. And, and he wasn't, you know, he wasn't like, he wasn't going to kill himself. Um, he wasn't endangering his life, but there was obviously a lot of anguish and pain. Something wasn't right. So they're praying for him. They don't know what to do. Robert calls me on the phone. He says, Dr. Dr. Morris, could you, could you come over and pray? Now, I don't think that you always have to do everything that needs to be done. You, you, you ask God. Like Jesus said, I, I don't do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me, right? So 
you can't always go everywhere, but, but you ought to pray and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? So I prayed. We prayed with my wife. And conviction, you need to go. So I prayed radical protection. You know what that is now, right? I prayed for the armor of God, the panoply of light, to cover my wife and my children as well as me. Because listen to me now. If you step into the battle, your loved ones need protection. This is a real battle. Don't just stroll over carelessly like that other young man did. So I pray the panoply of God over my wife and my children, get in my little car and drive to the campus of Southern Adventist University. And, and I know it's serious because the boys' dean is waiting for me at the front door. It's like 2.30 in the morning. He's waiting for me. I know it's serious as he escorts me through the lobby. <laughs> By the way, someone came to me recently. They said, man, there's a lot of problems on that campus. Well, actually, that didn't happen all the time. There's a lot of people who really love Jesus there. But, but you know, the battle's everywhere, isn't it? Well, I was there for 14 years, so these, it didn't happen every week. But it's real. Escorts me across the lobby into a stairwell, and there's a group of young men in the stairwell... This is now 2.30 in the morning, and they're praying. Thank God someone's praying. Because right through the wall, right through the wall on the first floor is Michael's room. He's sitting there on a couch, blood all over his arm. And the darkness is palpable. They're through the wall there in the stairwell. They're praying. I came in. I joined them in prayer. We're praying for the panoply of God, the armor of God, for radical protection. We're praying for ourselves, but we're also, we're also praying for Michael. He told us later he could see through the wall and could see us praying. He didn't want us to pray. Well, I want to tell you something. Still pray even when they don't want you to. <laughs> it's a battle. We're praying there. Finally, the door opens to the hallway. It's Michael's roommate. He looks down and he says he wants to see you. Well, I've learned something from reading the teachings of Jesus, and that is when you go into a situation like that, you shouldn't go by yourself. Because when Jesus sent them out, he sent them out how? Two by two, right? So I turned to one of my students in the stairwell praying, his name Andrew. I said, Andrew, will you go with me? He said, I will. And his life was changed that night by the power of God that he saw. So Andrew came with me. We walked through the, into the hallway, turned left, and then left into Michael's room. And as we walked into Michael's room, you could feel the darkness. Do you know what I'm talking about? I'm not talking about can we turn a light on here? I'm talking about darkness. You could feel the darkness. I walk into the room, Andrew by my side. I see things on the wall that shouldn't be there. And, but I'm, I'm, so, I'm so thankful. You know, we're all on a journey, right? We're, not, we're on a journey. Aren't you glad that God loves us wherever he finds us? <laughs> He's like, well... I'm not, I don't love you because you've got something bad on the wall. We still love our children, don't we? But we, we want to protect them from the evil one. So I walk in, Andrew by my side, and I reach out my hand to touch Michael's shoulder. And he turns, and in a monotone voice, he says, don't touch me. I thought, okay, okay, now what am I going to do? Well, if I've been filling my mind with the Word of God, I'm praying. I'm claiming the promise that the help of the Holy Spirit <laughs> will come to my aid, right? What's he going to do? What's the Holy Spirit going to do? He's going to bring to my remembrance the Word of God. And so I'm walking in, I'm, in, in my mind I'm praying, God, I prayed for radical protection, but like what do I do now? And, and a 
scripture flashed into my mind. Now, I know you may say, well, this is kind of weird. Flat. I want, there are people here that understand what I'm saying. If you fill your mind with the word of God, the Holy Spirit will help you. He's going to bring it to your remembrance. So a story flashed into my mind from the Gospel of Luke. Some of you know the story. When it came, I thought, why this story? You see, lambs aren't that strong, and they're not that... So I'm like, why that story? I'm going to get it in just a minute, but, you know, I'm a bit slow. Because the story that came to my mind was Jesus healing a blind man named Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus hears that Jesus is coming through Jericho, and he hears the crowd approaching, and so this blind man begins to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. He's heard that Jesus can make the blind see, that Jesus can even raise the dead. He can set people free from demonic activity. And so he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. This story is flashing into my mind. I'm like, and then finally, Jesus stops and asks Bartimaeus a question. Do you remember the question? Does anybody know the story? What do you want me to do for you? I thought, okay. Now, remember that we're not that strong and smart, so I'm not going to come up to him and say, Michael, what do you want me to do for you? Now, I've learned that lesson. So I'm not coming in my name. I'm coming in the name of... So I come to Michael, I turn to Michael, and I say, Michael, what do you want Jesus to do for you? And he answered immediately. He said, help me to forget. Now, what's your natural question when you hear Michael say, help me to forget? Forget what? And you know what? That's none of your business. Right? You know, we spend hours, you know, like, well, tell me all the other bad things. You know what? This young man has just cried out and he said, can Jesus help me to forget? I have a question for you today. Can Jesus help people to forget? If he can't, let's just all go home. I mean, why are we even here? If our Savior can't help a person to forget, I mean, he's able, isn't he? He can heal the brokenhearted and bind up their wounds. He can set the captives free. Could he help a person to forget? I said, okay, let's pray. So I kneeled down. Andrew kneels down by my side. Michael, still sitting on the sofa with the blood on his arm, we start to pray. And as we do, Michael kind of slumps down onto the floor, making noises, just like, whoa and he curls up into a ball. And I'm getting a little scared, so I just keep praying. He's curled up in a ball, and I'm praying in the name of Jesus that Jesus will help him to forget. I prayed blessing in Jesus' name. You know, I don't have to know all of the things, do I? Do we have to know everything a person needs? We're not that smart. God, you know what Michael needs, but he's made a simple request to you today. He said, can you help him to forget? I prayed the prayer in the name of Jesus. 
Amen. And Michael looked up at me. He's curled up in a bowl. He's a big, big fellow. I don't know, I see anybody here quite as... Got him. Big guy. He's curled up in a bowl on the floor, 23 years old. And he says to me, can I have a hug? And I thought to myself, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, when, when I walked in and went to put my hand on his shoulder, what did he say? Don't touch me. And now he wants a hug. And I know if I got down there, he could break my back. He's a big guy. I mean, you know, I'm just sharing that with you so you don't think, wow, Derek's like, he's like so, we struggle, you know. I'm like, I don't know if you can have a hug. So I I just kind of reached out. What's your name? Emmanuel. Emmanuel. So I I reached out and I kind of poked him to see if he was like really hard. Or if he was like, boing, you know, a little more. And he was like, boing. So I thought, okay, you know, he's not like just, you know, about, you know, can I have a hug? So I reached down. I'm on the floor now, got my arms around this big guy, and I'm, I'm hugging him, and he whispered in my ear, will he come back? I said, will who come back, Michael? He said, the dark man. Will the dark man come back? I said, how long has the dark man been troubling you, Michael? He said, Since I was six years old, every night, the dark man has come. I said, what happened to you when you were six years old? He said, my father committed adultery. He abandoned my mother. He abandoned me. And that father, who should have been praying radical protection for his family, thinks like, this is my life and I can do what I want with it. And he walks away when he should have been praying. Someone needs to pray. And the dark man seized his son by the soul. And every night, the dark man came. 17 years later, I have my arms around him. Will he come back? And God flashed the scripture into my mind. I wish I was more bold than I am. I want to be really bold for God. But God just flashed this text into my mind where Jesus, after he'd cast out an evil spirit, he said, leave him and never enter him again. You remember that? I'm not that smart. But that word flashed into my mind, and I prayed in the name of Jesus that this evil spirit, this dark man that had troubled Michael for so long would leave him and never enter him again. When I was working on the manuscript for Radical Protection book, I met Michael. You always wonder, you know, how did things go for him? Today, Michael is a professor in the School of Nursing at Southern Adventist University. (laughs) He's married to a beautiful Christian girl. 
He has two beautiful little girls. Do you think he prays protection for them? What do you think? Or does he just say, well, you know, it's their own life. I'll let them grow up and make their own choice. What a foolish thing to say. When Satan's trying to destroy everything that's dear to you, you're going to wait till they grow up and make their own decision? You've got to pray now, right? I'm so thankful Michael's walking with Jesus. But I learned something I will never forget. You see... After Jesus set Michael free and delivered him from that harassment, he visited with me a couple of days later. I have a transcript of every word that he said to me, if you'd like to read it. Because I don't believe in making up stories. I tell you the truth. I have a transcript of that meeting. Michael said to me, Dr. Morris, do you remember when you came into my room that night? You reached out your hand. <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, do you remember what I said? I said, yeah. Do you remember what he said? He said, when you came into my room that night, I wanted to hurt you. I wanted to hurt Andrew, too. Remember the young man that came with me? He said there were other people, including his roommate, that were there, but I didn't want to hurt them, but I wanted to hurt you. But I could not, because you were clothed with fire. You want to know what the armor of God looks like? Why, it's a, it's a joyful experience to the child of God in the midst of this battle to know you're covered with the armor of light. But to the enemy of the kingdom of heaven, to the kingdom of darkness, that panoply is like a consuming fire. I wanted to hurt you, but I could not because you were clothed with fire. I'm like, I can't smell it. And maybe even the enemy would say, oh, that's so silly, don't even pray for that. Well, of course the enemy doesn't want you to pray because when you're covered with the panoply of God, you are protected against all of the flaming darts of the evil one. Now, I know some of you are careful Bible students, and with this I close our meeting today. I know some of you are saying, but, but sometimes God may remove that hedge of protection, Job chapter 1, and may, may allow suffering to come for some bigger picture that we don't always understand. Do you know what I'm talking about? Okay, so God may allow that. And, and, and I would have to say that, that if God chooses me to have to go through that, I pray I will say like Job, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. I pray like Job, I will say no matter what Satan does, that I know that my Redeemer lives. But I tell you tonight, that I don't want the enemy beating up on my family, tearing down my children, crushing everything that's valuable just because I was careless and refused to pray. Someone has to pray. Someone has to stand in the gap in this battle, which is very real. And just like Michael prays for his wife, and his two little girls, that God would cover them. He gave permission for me to share his story with you so that you would believe that the armor of God makes a difference. And whatever you've learned during this day that we've spent together, if you've had the courage to say, God, could you use me to make a difference? 
or whether you're still saying, please continue to pray for me because I don't know, I'm struggling with that. I've got this really nice plan that I've made. I'm just hoping God will bless it. Wherever you are, we all desperately need the radical protection that God alone can provide. I plead with you, do not be careless. Someone needs your prayers. So you pray for her. You pray for him. You believe that God wants to use you to make a difference. I'm going to invite you just to bow your head in prayer right now. Is there someone who's come to your mind? It, it may be your family, maybe a brother, a sister. It may be you. You say, you know what, I haven't even prayed. I feel like the enemy's beating up on me. I want you just to take a moment in silence. Just close your eyes. Don't look around at other people. And you pray that prayer in Jesus' name. You claim the radical protection that God alone can provide. Let's just spend a moment to pray in silence. Our Father in heaven, you have heard every prayer, every heart cry. We bring those prayers to you in the name of Jesus. We're not even we're not even worthy to approach your throne to come into your presence in prayer, but we come in Jesus' name knowing that you love us and have offered a perfect salvation for all who believe and more than just redemption, you offer radical protection. So we don't need to live in fear in this battle, though the battle is very real. We don't need to be immobilized or terrorized. We can be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. And I pray that this would not be the last time we pray for the panoply to cover us and our families and those that you bring to our minds, but that we would continue earnestly in prayer, that we would pr pray at all times with all kinds of prayers, that we would pray without ceasing. And I thank you that you have heard every prayer offered. And now, Lord, as we as we conclude this day of worship and fellowship, I thank you that while we leave this place, we never need to leave your presence. For you have said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Thank you for that promise. And as we're closing this prayer time, I'm just impressed by the Spirit of God to ask again, is there someone here and you've never 
accepted Jesus as your Savior. You've never said, Jesus, will you be my deliverer and my protector? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if there's someone right now and you want to say, please save me and protect me, would you just raise your hand with your eyes closed? God sees the hands that are raised. I thank you, God, that you've heard our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen.